he looked me right in the eye. It's as if he had known me for all eternity. As if he knew that my life was about to be forever changed. Monday morning came, and there was a lot of excitement to start the day. I had to prevent a riot. This Jesus was in the temple. He was overturning tables. He was driving out the merchants, saying that they were defiling his temple. Well, after I got that under control, there were some children, and they were singing, and they were praising this Jesus, singing Hosanna to the son of David. But also, at the same time, there was a group of Pharisees, religious leaders, They were gathered in the corner, and they began to whisper amongst themselves. And so I moved in just a little closer to hear what they were saying. They were rebuking this man, and they were saying, we have to kill him. Kill him? Well, that got my attention. Now I had reason to be here in Jerusalem. Tuesday quickly passed. Not much problems. But Wednesday, that's when things got interesting. I saw one of Jesus' followers one named Judas Iscariot. He was going to the chief priests and to the officers of the temple court. And so, again, I moved in close enough to hear what was happening, to listen to their conversation. And Judas, this Judas, one of Jesus' followers, was discussing on how he could betray him. It didn't make sense to me. They were devising a plan. These Jewish leaders we're offering this Judas 30 silver coins in return. And so I marked on my scroll that night, keep an eye on this Judas. The Thursday evening came. I heard that Jesus and his disciples were eating dinner in an upper room of a certain house. There was already enough trouble surrounding these men, so I posted guard outside the house. But late into the evening, this Judas Iscariot character I caught him running, running out of the house, and so I followed him. I followed him to see where he was going to go, and again, he went right to the chief priests and the, and the elders, and I overheard them saying, listen, Jesus is going to be praying in the Garden of Gethsemane tonight. That's where you need to make your move. That's where you need to arrest him, and they began forming this mob. I wasn't exactly sure what to do. I didn't want trouble. So I ran ahead into the garden, and I hid myself. And that's where I found Jesus. He was, he was praying at a rock by himself. And his disciples, they were sleeping. I was going to tell him. I was going to warn him of what was going to happen. But as I heard the mob coming, I cowered in fear. I saw Judas leading this crowd with torches and swords and lanterns, spears. And this Judas, this follower of Jesus, walked right up to him and kissed him. What was happening? And this crowd, or Jesus asked, who is it you're looking for? As if he already knew who they were looking for, and the the crowd replied, Jesus of Nazareth, I am he, he replied. I was amazed with such power and authority this man spoke. Why would he willingly give himself up to these people, knowing what they were after? I didn't understand. I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't understand this man, but something, something was drawing my heart towards him. Thursday night became Friday morning. As they were taking Jesus to a meeting before the Sanhedrin, we stumbled across another one of Jesus' followers who also denied knowing him or having anything to do with him. I don't remember his name, but I knew that I had seen this man with Jesus. And even though I didn't know this man, it broke my heart. Watching his followers abandon him one by one when he needed them most. But it was in these next several hours of pure chaos where they led Jesus 
before a Roman government official, Pilate, whom it was my duty to protect. And then they led him to another governor of Galilee, one named Herod Antipas. They would eventually lead him back to Pilate again. This man, Jesus, was berated with questions, one after the other. This man was ridiculed and mocked. But at the end of the day, Pilate said, I can find no charge against this man, and neither can Herod. But astoundingly, the crowd who was chanting Hosanna just a few days before was chanting, crucify him. Pilate didn't have one, he didn't want anything to do with this. So he handed them over to some of my soldiers to be flogged, hoping that this would appease these bloodthirsty people. I'd never seen anything like it. And our Roman floggings were brutal. They were done with a multi-stranded tool. And to the ends were tied bits of bone and lead. The whip would be struck against the back of the bare accused. I thought to myself, surely now, surely now this Jesus, he's going to defend himself. He's going to make his move. He's going to do something miraculous if he is who he says, but nothing. It was silent. I could do nothing but my job. To simply sit there and watch as my soldier brutally, fiercely scourged his back, ripping the flesh with each lashing. They continued to beat and mock Jesus. They stripped down his clothing. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They gave him a staff and they yelled, Hail, King of the Jews. And one of my soldiers took his staff and he beat him over the head with it. I wish I could have done something. Pressed the thorns further into his scalp. They spit on him. They struck him in the face. And they led him back to Pilate. Pilate brought Jesus back out before the people. And he said, behold this man. Behold your king. And then he brought out another man. A murderer. Barabbas. He said, I'm going to release one to you. Whom do you want to be released? It was custom during Passover to have this done. And I thought for sure they, they, were, going to, they were going to say, Jesus, bring him back. But they didn't. They said, we want Barabbas, a murderer. Pilate said, well, what do I do with Jesus? And they just yelled all the louder, crucify him, crucify him. I was in shock. And so they led Jesus away to be crucified. And our crucifixions were cruel. They took these heavy wrought iron nails. And we would drive them through the wrists of the victims into the cross beams. And we would drive these nails into the feet, into the vertical beam. And when they would lift the victim up so that he would have difficulty breathing. And to ease the pain, the victim would lift with their feet and bring easing to the breathing, but extreme agony to the feet. As I drove these nails into the wrists and to the feet of Jesus, these nails were cold between my fingertips. But the blood was warm as it ran down my arm. And with each blow of the hammer, the guilt weighed heavier and heavier. And for the first time in my life, I found myself choking back the tears as I began to realize I was sorely mistaken about this Jesus. And as my soldiers hoisted that cross into position, Jesus said something profound. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. I couldn't help in that moment to fall to my knees. 
with the hammer still in my hand. As I thought to myself, what have I done? Even amid dying on the cross, in a time of intense physical pain and mental anguish, this Jesus was only worried about the forgiveness of those who wronged him. And I knew I couldn't deny him anymore. But now a changed man. I couldn't help but shout, surely this was a righteous man. Surely this was the son of God. Surely he was all that he claimed to be. And with my hands still stained with his blood, I thought of his amazing grace that I had seen all that week. This Jesus was indeed the Savior of the world who willingly, willingly laid down his life for sinners like me. I believed, and the weight of my guilt was lifted because his blood makes me innocent. And now, even me, a Roman centurion, can say, I am forgiven. Six feet under, I could have been lost forever. Yeah, I should be in that fire, but now there's fire inside of me. Here I am, a dead man walking, no grave gonna. Forgive it, forgive 
Was I at the cross? Yes. Yes, I was. At first, I couldn't help but see it as a tragedy. The midnight arrest in the garden, the late night trials, his disciples fleeing. It was all somewhat of a blur. But as I think of the cross, I cannot help but think of what came before. You see, I am Mary, Mary of Magdala. I was possessed by demons, seven of them. They tormented me day after day. What were those days like? It's a terrible thing to ask. Darkness, those voices mocking me. Again, much of it is a blur. I remember men would surround me, strike me. The people, they were afraid of me. So they cast me out. I wandered from town to town. I was alone. There was no one to help me. In those days, my mind was a frightening place. It was plagued by accusations. Those voices whispered that I was a worthless wretch. If I dare to protest, to, to struggle at all, the voices rose to a shriek. They screamed that I was a degenerate scum. And I believed them. In those moments when I possessed even a portion of my own mind, I suppose I could have cried to God for help, but it felt like God had abandoned me, forsaken my spirit, delivered me to the forces of darkness. Darkness reigned in my life, in my mind. It seemed as though the ground shook beneath my feet. The whole world shook. And the Lord, it was as if he had forgotten me. Until, you know, if you had spoken to me, I would have said that I longed for death. That life was bitter to my soul. I was in misery. And I would have rejoiced to find the grave. But one day, he called me. Through the fog, the whispers, and the darkness, he called my name. Mary of Magdala. And from that moment, Everything changed, even my clothes. I kept the old ones to remind myself of that day when I became free, free to follow him, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, of not only of Israel, but of the whole world. A rabbi, my deliverer. And so I can never forget the day that he delivered me, that he freed me. In the same way, I can never forget the day he died. Again, many things happened, and again, it felt like a blur. 
almost as if the demons had returned. Men struck him with whips and fists. They stuck a crown of thorns on his head, pierced his side with a spear. Had he not rescued me from crowds like this? How could he himself be placed at their mercy? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His word pierced my soul. In my sane moments, had I not cried those very words, he had saved me from that. How could he be calling the same thing? The crowd he called jeers, but I could not help but wonder. He saved me. Could he not save himself? They cried, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. I knew he was the Christ, the anointed one who had come to save us all. But in that moment, I too struggled to believe. The sky once again grew dark. The ground beneath me once again shook. He breathed his last. The centurion nearby testified, surely this man was the son of God. I knew it. We all did. But at the foot of the cross, it felt impossible. He had rescued my spirit from the demonic forces. How could he give up his own? He had given me a new beginning. How could he say, it is finished? But as I stood there, at the foot of the cross, staring at his now limp body. It was then I understood. It is finished. Not it is done, but it has been accomplished. The reason he came his mission had been completed. And that was the meaning of the cross. It wasn't some random disconnected tragedy, as painful as it was. But my deliverer took my darkness, my demons, the death that should have been mine upon himself. He died to set me free, to set us all free. So the cross means that I can see clearly. The cross means I live in the light. The cross means I have hope. And the cross means I am free. You stand and worship with us tonight. is free. 
I was eight years old. My father and I were taking a load of olives down the mountain in our family cart. <laughs> Used to let me ride in it. I would stand up as we descended, feel the wind in my hair. What a thrill. Our donkey, <laughs> I called him Petra, because he was dumb as a rock. He stumbled and veered off the path before my father could stop him. He had run into a group of Roman soldiers, resting from guard duty down in the city in the shade of the trees on the hillside. Petra ran over the first man who was laying down and then smashed into the second before he could move out of the way. The cart finally came to a stop when we crashed into one of the larger olive trees in the grove. <laughs> it was the best ride I ever had until I looked down at my arm. It was broke for sure. As the pain set in, I looked to my Abba, for help. He was talking to some of the guards. They were furious. It seemed the cartwheel broke the leg of one of the one on the ground and knocked the other out cold. And I... Excuse me. My father kept apologizing trying to tell them that it was an accident. And then they started to push him. Knocked him down. I ran out of the cart and stood over him, screaming at those pigs to leave him alone. And everything just... 
Things just happen so fast. One soldier kicked me out of the way while the other drew his sword. I fell atop the one with the broken leg. He moaned, good. I had no love for those Roman occupiers. As I looked up, I saw the soldier with the sword. I saw him run my father through. I can still see the bright red blood on the blade as it withdrew, as it withdrew from his dead body. I screamed in rage and pulled the sword from the belt of the guard I was laying on. It was so heavy. But I had to avenge my father. I could barely lift it, even with two hands, and my left arm burned with searing agony as I tried to swing it at the man who had killed my Abba, my daddy. It was no use, though. Last thing I remember was being hit with the flat of the blade on the head. And then darkness overtook me. When I awoke, I was home, my mother standing over me with a wet cloth, dabbing my head. I could barely talk. My mouth was so dry, but I managed to squeak out the one word question that was burning in my heart. Abba? I saw tears leap from her eyes and fall down into my chest as she slowly shook her head. That day, I vowed to God that I would do everything in my power to avenge my father and drive those Gentile pigs from our land. I left home when I was 16 years old and joined up with other like-minded men who desired to overthrow the Romans. I trained with the sword, took part in small operations, anything I could get my hand on. Petty theft, whatever it was, as my skills grew. That led to larger missions involving ambushing Roman transports and even killing low-level Roman officials. We lived in the wilderness. Life was difficult. But the memory of that bloodied sword provided hatred as fuel enough to endure any hardship. Before I knew it, I had risen quite far in the ranks of the zealots, far enough to lead raids against small outposts. I had Roman blood on my hands, yet still, still it was not enough to satisfy the rage inside of me of what they had done. One night, we snuck into a Roman camp to steal the lockbox they were transporting. Went wrong right from the start. They must have known we were coming. <laughs> Betrayed. I thought this would be, would be the end, and I wasn't going to go down without a fight. I would spend the last drop of my blood and then join my father in Sheol, the grave. Well... <laughs> That was my plan anyway. They threw a net over me. I got all tangled in it trying to get out. And I just fell to the ground like that helpless eight-year-old boy so long ago. And then another blow and blackness. I woke to bright sunlight as I lay in the dirt on a small hillside. I could see the city close by. And I was surrounded by Roman soldiers. They stretched out my arms, and when I saw the nail, I knew what was happening. The crucifixion, a fitting end for the likes of me. They raised me up as the cross pole bottomed out. I felt a jolt that sent blistering pain, shooting up my legs and down my arms. The agony was so great, and it did not stop. I hung there for hours. 
There were three of us by my count. The guy next to me, though, he was a bloody mess. I guess those Roman dogs had their fun with him before hanging him up there. Poor fool. I don't even know how he was still breathing. The crowd gathered seemed to be fixated on that man. They shouted insults and curses at him, and then it made sense. I get it. Just another crazy claiming to be Messiah. I joined right in with the insults. After all, I had nothing else better to do while I waited. Yet something about him was different. At one point, he looked out to those that had hung him there, and instead of breathing out hatred and threats, you know what he said? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Who could do that? Forgive those murdering Romans for what they had done to him. I thought on this as the day wore on. At some point, the guy on the other side of Jesus, was that his name? He yelled at him, crying out, are you the Messiah? If so, save yourselves and us. And something inside my soul snapped at that moment. I can't explain to you what happened. I I don't understand. I I can't describe what came over me. But at that moment, I knew, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that that man was Messiah. I yelled back, have you no fear of God? We deserve this punishment for our crimes. But this This is an innocent man. I was a man consumed by anger and revenge. I was a violent man who had more blood guilt than I could possibly bear. But this man, this man could take it all away. All I had to do was cry out to him for forgiveness. I am a thief. I am a murderer. Walking up this lonely hill. What have I done? I don't remember No one knows just how I feel But I know that my time is coming soon It's been so Yes, such a long time since I've lived with peace and rest. Now I am here, my destination. I guess things were for the
My time has come. I'm slowly fading, but I deserve what I receive. Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, could you please, please remember? Were you there? I was. I can still recall the events of those days and never forget them as long as I live, long as Yahweh gives me breath. Where shall I start? As a young boy, after my bar mitzvah, I remember hearing the rabbis teaching the importance of knowing and believing the truth of God. I can still hear their voices. Nicodemus, who may dwell in the, in the uh, sacred tent of the Lord and who may ascend his holy mountain? The words of the psalm flow from my lips as freely today as they did back in that day. He who is pure in heart, who does what is righteous and who speaks the truth from his heart. That boy, Nicodemus, vowed, to God, that he would always speak the truth, as King David said so long ago. That vow has caused me more trouble than you could ever imagine. My life was going well. I was one of the 70 most prominent and wealthy people, men of all Israel. I was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, the lawmakers. God had blessed me beyond measure. May his name be praised. Until the day, one day, the word started coming in about a new rabbi, a teacher named Yeshua, Jesus. The entire northern region of Galilee was ablaze with stories of miracles and healings. People reported that Jesus cured entire villages of disease and that he even had the power to send Demons back to Sheol from where they came. Even was said to have healed entire towns of disease. And one man reported that he, he even had the nerve to say that Jesus had seen bring, he had seen bring a, a man back to life. When I first heard these claims, I, along with everyone else, was skeptical. After all, these Galileans are but a country bunch, not very learned, and not everything that they, they say is the truth, to put it nicely. But it was my job to seek the truth. It was my vow. Yeshua had been coming to Jerusalem regularly to attend the feasts as the Torah of Moses had commanded. So I set out to investigate this man for myself. I was not prepared for what I saw. The blind received sight. 
the lame made whole again. Compassion shown to the, to the poor and the needy. And his words, his words, no rabbi ever taught like him. His teachings had a way of setting your heart on fire from within. It was if, as if he had authority from God himself. I knew that I had to speak with this man privately, for the things he was doing, he must be a rabbi sent from God. No one could perform these miraculous signs unless what he was doing, if God was with him. The very law I had always relied upon and taught to others was shifting right before my eyes. But how to meet with him? That was the question. Hmm. My colleagues seemed to uh, have determined, uh, made up their minds that he was a false teacher without ever speaking to him. But I am a seeker of the truth. So I came to him at night so that our others would not see. During our meeting, he told me that I must be born from, a, from above, born again, if I was to see the kingdom of heaven. As you could imagine, this was all very confusing to me. How can a man be born again when he is old? Could I enter into my mother's womb a second time? He said that he came not to condemn, but to save. And that the light had come into the world, but the people loved the darkness more. He seemed to be saying that I needed to believe a different truth than I had previously. He claimed to be God's son, and that if I believed in him as Messiah, then I would not perish, but receive eternal life. That night I went to bed with my head spinning. Over the next months and years, opposition to Yeshua grew as fast as his followers did. Reports of miracles continued to come in as, as the spring rains. One day on the Feast of Tabernacles, the priests were about to pour the water, and everyone was quiet. He stood up and said, if anyone was thirsty, to come to him and he would give them living streams of water flowing from within him. That teaching, although very dramatic, did not go over well with the Pharisees. In their anger and jealousy, they sent a group of ten temple guardsmen to arrest Jesus. There was so much division in that crowd between his supporters and his detractors that the guards simply left him go. When they were questioned as to why they did not follow orders, they said, no one ever spoke as he did. He must have made quite an impact on the guards as well. I just bit my tongue so as not to cause any more division or trouble. Not satisfied with their answer, my colleagues asked if any more of the guard or, for that matter, any of us Pharisees had believed in him also. The derogatory question struck home with me at that moment. Had I believed in him? Was he the true Messiah? I was not yet sure. But my tongue was loose from its prison, and I spoke out even in spite of myself. Does our law condemn a man before even hearing him first, without even knowing what he is doing? Well, they immediately struck out against me, saying, Are you also an ignorant, foolish, backwater Galilean as well? Any learned person knows that no prophet was to come from Galilee, were they so ignorant of the truth that they themselves did not know he was born in Bethlehem? Raka, fools! The hatred of my fellow leaders grew to fever pitch one Passover about three years after I had met the man. The Pharisees were, were clashing with him almost daily, and to be honest, 
They were no match for his knowledge of the truth of God. They tried to falsely accuse him, to trap him with legal questions, and to discredit him in the eyes of the people. But despite all their efforts, he only grew in stature. There was nothing left for them to do but eliminate him, to kill him, to murder this innocent man in defiance of the truth spoken in the law of Moshe, Moses, that says, you shall not kill. Yet, this is what they did, gave him a mockery of a trial, and then bullied the Roman Gentiles into doing their dirty work. It was terrible, you know, how they beat him and mocked him and spit on him. The blood, so much blood as he hung there on that cursed tree. You know what I heard him say? He said, Father, forgive them, for they dot do not know what they are doing. Such love, even for those who murdered him. That was the moment that I believed in him. I was convinced that he was, who he said he was, the Son of God. Rumor found me one day that my fellow councilman, Joseph of Arimathea, I was getting permission to bury the body of Yeshua as, was, as before sundown, as was proper. Oh, to have his courage. He had not consented to this horrible crime committed against Messiah. Now, however, things would be different. No more hiding, no more half measures. My heart was set. We would bury Jesus in Joseph's family tomb. I bought expensive spices to anoint his body. We washed him as best we could and wrapped him in fine linen cloth. And the law of Moses said that I was unclean even for touching a dead body and that I was unable to celebrate the remaining feast. But I never had I done a purer thing than we did that day. And word got out what I did. All the powers of this world broke upon me. I lost everything I once held dear. But I gained so much more. You know, the one thing I remember that Jesus said over and over, I am the way, the truth, and the life. From my childhood, this is all I ever wanted, to know the truth of God. Now I know the truth. His name is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah.
You may be seated. see if this works. And I don't know how to put a shirt on. Were you there Were you there? Yeah, I was there. I wasn't nailed to the cross next to him. I wasn't waiting at the bottom to take his body off. I, I wasn't there having my moment of salvation, proclaiming he was God. No. No, I was there. Where was I? I was as far away as possible. As far away as possible, but I could still see it, but I couldn't even, I, sorry, I'm sorry. I, I have this tendency, I, um, I get too excited, and I can't, I can't keep it down. And uh, he knew that. He knew it all too well. Maybe I can start at the beginning. So, ever since I was a kid, um, I can't say I was too interested in learning what you're supposed to learn. You know, you're supposed to go to instruction. You're supposed to go to school. You're supposed to learn all those things. I, it's, it just really wasn't for me, you know? My instructors would all be like, oh, Simon, Simon. Kid's got a lot of passion, but uh, man, he, do, he just doesn't know how to focus. Well, if you maybe teach me something I care about, maybe, maybe I'd do something with it. I don't know. Andrew, he was, he was a lot better at it than I was, you know? That was my, that was my brother, Andrew. Things just came natural to him like that. And whenever something would happen that would make me really upset, he'd, he'd always had the, the ability just to stand down. He never really seemed to get really into it. I always admired that about him, but it always drove me, drove me crazy, too. Well, I would go to instruction. I would, I would, I would go learning. They, they would try to teach me the things that you're supposed to learn, and have you ever tried to really study the law? It's really, really, really hard. And I don't know what they expect from us. We're from Galilee. We don't really know much. We don't have much there. Um, so early on, I realized that I didn't really care for this. I just, I just need something to do. Give me, give me the, the nuts and bolts. What can I do? And it was really, really simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I could do that. I could do that. Simple guy like me. Take that, took it into my life, and I, I think I did a really good job following the law. I really did. And I really tried to do what I thought would honor God, really. Really. I love the idea of God that, I don't know, I was, 
over all of us. We had our nation. We had the rich history and everything. I knew all about that. But it's really hard to feel confident about it when the country that's supposed to be yours is just full of occupiers. How are you supposed to feel like a victor in that? And so I just took my pragmatism and just kept with the religion the way that I know how to do it. And I took to the sea. In a weird way, whenever I go out to the sea and I go fish, it had a calming thing. It just calmed me down whether I caught fish or not. I mean, this was my livelihood, but at least you get out to the ocean. And in a really weird way, whenever there'd be a big storm, I'm supposed to act like I'm really scared and, you know, concerned for the rest of the crew, but I really enjoyed it. The, because there was nothing I could compare the passion and turmoil going on in here with anything else. And so when I take it out to the ocean and I met my match, and there was nothing I could do. I couldn't yell at the ocean enough to make it stop. And in a way, it would actually kind of take away that fire that's in here that just doesn't ever seem to go out. So I just did my thing and tried to be a good husband. My wife is a treasure. She is a treasure. And she's also a very loving woman. Uh, her mom lives with us. As soon as... Everything happened with her, with her father. She said, you're coming with us. And what am I going to tell her? No. So that's the kind of woman she is. I don't deserve her. I really don't. And I just kind of got into the rhythm. That's how my life is going to go. I'm going to love the Lord my God. I'm going to, I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to go fish, bring in money when I can. But this wouldn't go away. This, this wouldn't go away. And I didn't know what was going to take it away. And I would say things, and I, I don't mean them. I don't mean them when I say them. I hear how stupid they sound, and I wish I could just take it all back, but I can't. And now I'm in the, 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 the trouble that I'm in over and over again. This wife it was a gift to me, and I, I just keep... this. Stuff coming out of my mouth. But we're going to be okay, right? We're going to be okay. I hoped we would, but I, I didn't have the answer. It wouldn't stop. Until the strangest thing happened. One day, I was, I was at home. I was, I was getting the nets ready. And Andrew comes running, flying in. He doesn't do this. If you know Andrew, he's... Very calm. He says, Simon, we found the Messiah. That's random. Okay. So I go with him. And my whole life, I have been the one that calls my own shots. I don't care who comes to me. Whatever I feel, whatever I think, that's how this situation is going to go. But I came around the corner, and I saw this man, and he looked me in the eye, and I was terrified of what I saw. Terrified. But at the same time, I wanted him to know everything that I've ever felt and ever known. I wanted him to tell him everything that's ever happened in my life. And he looks at me and says, oh, so you're Simon. <laughs> yeah hmm. well you are going to be known as Peter okay <laughs> that's strange right but as weird as it sounds he could have said like you know, your name could have been something weird like Jeff or something and I would have I would have been okay with it I was intrigued about this man. I wanted to see him again. So time went on, and I heard he was, he was, he was teaching. 
around, and uh, he was teaching different places, not just in like the synagogue, but he would go to the beach and stuff and teach there, which is kind of more my thing. Well, he was teaching one time when, when we were out there, we were getting our, getting, getting our boat ready for the load, and he looks at me and he says, hey, Simon, how many fish you caught today? Why today? Why did he have to ask today? Um, teacher, uh, I have caught no fish today. Oh, oh, okay. Have you tried putting the nets on the other side of the boat? Nope. Why don't you, why don't you give that a shot? Okay, okay. Because you say so. Guys, go out again. Put the nets on the other side of the boat, and all of a sudden, we're about to go capsize because we look over, and inside that net is the most fish I've ever seen in a catch. And we take it in, and we can't even count them. There's just so many fish. And he looks at me and says, it's a good catch, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good catch. You follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. That was it. No second thoughts. I was in. Finally, this, this passion inside of me just to do whatever I want, whatever I felt it, it followed after something that made sense. That was the smartest thing I have ever done in my life, making that decision to follow him. But at the same time, it felt like there was no other thing for me to do. I had clarity. I had desire. And we were just going to see what was going to happen from then on. Me, Andrew, a bunch of other guys that I had never known, we became really, really good friends. Best three years of my life. You should have seen the things we saw. Unbelievable. At one point, we were on a boat. Jesus wasn't with us. He's, he was always with us, but there was lots of times he'd go out by himself and he would pray. He, so we, we just got used to, okay, this is Jesus, his me time. He'd be by himself. And we were out there, and all of a sudden, I swear we saw a ghost on that sea, just glowing, coming towards us. And they're freaking out. But then we say, wait a second, that's not a ghost, that's Jesus. And I say, Jesus, Lord, if that's you, call me to come under the water. And he says, it's me. So without a second thought, I jump right onto the water, get out of that boat, start walking right towards him feeling pretty good, but it was a little choppy. It was choppy that night. Remember I said I, I liked it because it would always make me feel like I've met my match. It would calm me down, but that wasn't the feeling then. Instead, I see the one whom I've trusted, and I take my eyes off of him, and I see all the waves around and I realize I'm standing on water and that this is impossible and that these things shouldn't happen. And so instead of keep, instead, instead of keeping faith where it needs to be, I just start to sink. Go right down into the water. And that's the end. It should have been. It should have been the end. But as I'm going down, a hand comes right through the water and pulls me right up again. Lovingly and sternly says, oh, you of little faith. Brings me back on the ship. I'm soaking wet. From then on, it was a lesson for me. It doesn't matter what happens. The impossible is what to expect when I follow Jesus. And so some time went on, and he would always ask the group questions, and for whatever reason, they just considered me the spokesman, or I just didn't let them talk, and I just 
you know, that's probably more what happened. And um, there was this really heartbreaking moment. He had hundreds of people follow him. Hundreds of people follow him at one point. And he goes out and he tells them, he says, hey, uh, all you hundreds of people, now that I'm really popular, he doesn't say it quite like that, but that's what I'm hearing. Nobody's going to go to heaven unless you eat my body and drink my blood. What? I, I think I heard that wrong. Oh, I said, um, nobody goes to heaven unless they eat my body and drink my blood. And then all those hundreds of people just leaving. Except for me and my friends. And he looks at, at us and he says, so are you going to leave too? And I say, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. I don't know where that came from. That's, I don't speak clearly like that. Every time I feel something, it comes out wrong. It comes out stupid. But whenever he asks a question that has an answer that needs to come from somewhere else, it's like it's not even me talking. And he's working through me. And his Holy Spirit's upon me. And I'm able to give these answers that have no earthly explanation. He asked again, he said, who do people say that I am? They say, well, some of them said, well, they say that you're John the Baptist or that you're a prophet, you're Elijah. And he looks at me dead in the eye, he says, who do you say that I am? And I said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. I felt it, I knew it, I said it. And he says, and you are Peter. And on this rock of truth, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You got to know how happy I felt at that point. I was flying so high. Because now I'm doing the right thing. This is exactly what I needed to do, exactly what I needed to say. And then not two minutes later, stupid Simon comes back. Stupid Simon. He tells us, you know that the Son of Man has to go and be tried. He has to be killed and he will rise again. I took Jesus because I know better than he does, obviously. I took Jesus to the side and I rebuked him for that. Why? I still don't understand. Sometimes I say things so stupid and he called me out for it. And he says, get behind me, Satan. And instead of being hurt, I was challenged and my faith was restored. Later on, we go for Passover. He washes everybody's feet. I said, Lord, don't wash my feet. I'm not worthy of that. And he says, this is what I came to do. And if you're not going to let me wash your feet, you have no part with me. I said, whoa, 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 okay, uh, well, <laughs> if you, for that, you wash my head, wash, you know, just dump it all on me. He says, no, just calm down. Your body is cleansed. Your belief with me is enough that the Son of Man came to serve. And you will take up that cross and you will do the same. Then after that, we ate a big meal, and then he wanted to go out and sing in the middle of the night. I don't know if you've ever tried to do that, eat a big meal, then go outside in the middle of the night and try to sing and then have somebody pray. You get very tired. I fell asleep. I'm sorry. But the next thing I knew, we woke up, and he was being taken away. He was taken away, and I was scared. I ran away. I didn't know what to do. So I, 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 I wanted to know where they were going with him. So I stayed close behind but kind of hidden. And then they said, wait a second, you were with him, weren't you? No, no, I wasn't. That wasn't me, that wasn't me. No, 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 I think I remember you. You, you were a Galilean, right? No, that wasn't me. Yeah, I remember you with Jesus. You were one of the disciples. That wasn't me. I can't stand the way I do things 
I feel it. I don't know why I do this, but every time that I just let it go, stupid comes out, and I make the dumbest decisions. And as I said that, Jesus, afar off, looks right at me in the eye. And it comes back to me what he said the night before. Peter, you will deny me this night. It cut right to my heart. And so from there, I watched the crucifixion. Not close. I, I, I wasn't brave. I, I didn't come with them to the bottom of the cross. I wasn't nailed there. I wasn't waiting for his body. I stood far away. And I felt that passion burning up again. I was looking right at him. And the passion's welling up, welling up, welling up, welling up. And I'm ready just to take action. And in that moment, I hear him say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that passion subsides. And it has subsided forever. Salvation comes from him alone. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love and the, uh, the promises that we have from the cross. As we enter into this time remembering your table, that our hearts be thankful and humble, knowing that salvation only comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen. For the last few moments we have together, it's our custom on Good Friday to share the Lord's table together. If you have not received the elements, just uh, wave us down and we'll bring you some. I think there's some gentlemen in the back that'll bring it right to you. The table that we are about to uh, observe is open to all believers. This isn't something that is for just people that come to Berean. Everybody who is a believer who, has, who has, uh, knows that Jesus Christ is their Savior, you may, you may take. However, there is also what's to consider is that we take our, the communion with the right heart. So we're going to give you a few minutes to reflect, examine your hearts, that you know that it is at peace with God, you are in fellowship, and then we can begin. You may continue to examine your hearts as Trent sings for you the song he wrote, Sinful Mind. It's a song you've heard before. If you'd like to sing along, feel free. Selfish indulgence I sought my desires Just temporary pleasures my heart is these illusions of happiness leading to death, this thirst for satisfaction never quench. And in my sin, your blood was shed.
that last supper, Jesus said, this is my new covenant. And this is my body given for you. So please take out your bread. Together we will take after saying a simple prayer. Jesus, thank you for your body given for us. Jesus, thank you for your body given for us. You may take any. Since birth I raised to feel this void. This emptiness in my heart destroyed. It was you I saw all this time. Your offering of love I declined. In my sin, your blood. To take my place on that tree, the wrath of God poured on that cross. You traded my judgment for mercy. The shed blood of Jesus is the only remission for sins. He died once for all, one time for the sins of all mankind. His blood washes away all of your sin. And that's it. No other way to heaven. And that's what we remember. That's what we celebrate. Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. So with a simple prayer, we'll give him thanks and say, thank you, Jesus, for your blood that was shed for me. Let's say it together. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that was shed for me.
that are here online. I hope that you all know Jesus as your Savior. It's very, very simple. All of us are sinners. Every single one of us was, was, was far away from God. We all deserve condemnation, and that is eternity in hell, and hell is a very real place. But because of Jesus' great love, he died on the cross, paid for your sins, took all the punishment, and then rose again from the dead. You believe in that, you inherit eternal life, and it comes from him. No good works can ever get you there all comes from God, His grace, His love. If that's something you would like to, learn, to know more about, please come talk to us. We'd love to explain to you from the scriptures. Now as we close, I have to remind you that we have a, a big full weekend. I'd love to see you back tomorrow night for our Easter cantata, the drama that is going to talk about the same things we talk about tonight, but in even a different way, and uh, focusing on the resurrection is to come. And of course, the Easter morning is coming. So it's time to uh, uh, make the plans to be with us. Sunday morning, we have our, our sunrise service. We have the normal service. It's a full day, 7 to 12 o'clock. Oh, my goodness. What else would you do on Easter except go to church? So I'm going to uh, close us out with prayer. Thank you for coming. Jesus, thank you so much. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have this ability to come and, and worship you. And thank you for all the amazing things you've done for us. Thank you for saving all those individuals back then and then you continue to do so. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost and that was them and that is us now and that's who we were. Some of which were some of us, but by your great love, you forgave us. You gave us a new standing. To see this in the high heavenly places, not because of our own good works, but because of your great love and the finished work on the cross. So as we, uh, as if we just started this weekend, may it be in our hearts, not just at this time, but all year round, that we serve a risen Savior and He's in the world today. And I know that He is living no matter what man may say. Continue to move in the hearts of those who have not known you yet, that they can know true redemption. May the Lord bless you and keep you and God's his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.